Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to the San Francisco Elasticsearch Meetup on this fine Thursday. Uh, San Francisco's uh, Elasticsearch Meetup, for anyone new, is the oldest uh, Elasticsearch-related meetup in the world, apparently. We were created before Elastic was a company. So thank you for coming uh, to this um, meetup. Big thank you to Yelp for hosting us tonight and providing such a great event space. Um, please, if you see anyone from Yelp, convince them to do this every week. That would be great. Um, uh, and uh, also, they're, they're, they are hiring, so please do see, uh, do consider working for Yelp if, you can, if, if, if you're looking. Uh, tonight's talk is a great one about Yelp's evolution, uh, evolution of Yelp's elastic search powered ranking platform. It's no point me telling you about it because I wasn't involved in the project, so I'm going to introduce you to Krishna here, who is going to introduce the talk and the speakers involved in tonight's talk. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, thanks for coming out and welcome. So, like Salar mentioned, uh, today we'll be talking about the evolution of Yelp Search backend into the ranking platform, which is powered by Elasticsearch. So, so before we get started, just a quick note about Yelp's mission, which is connecting people with great local businesses. Uh, to just give folks a idea of the scale at which Yelp runs, uh, we have over 184 million reviews as of Q1 2019. Uh, we have a monthly average uh, of uh, 35 million unique visitors in Q1, uh, as well as 69 million via the web. Uh, search is a pretty critical functionality at Yelp, and uh, how do those, some of those metrics translate to Yelp search? Uh, we have millions of documents uh, indexed in Elasticsearch uh, over various deployments in our dev stage and cloud ecosystems. Uh, this powers <clears throat> hundreds of millions of queries, uh, search queries uh, every day, uh, and we support real-time indexing in the order of minutes. So, uh, like I said, like we have a bunch of such applications that use Elasticsearch uh, at Yelp. Uh, just to give you a, a quick preview, uh, so the screenshot on your uh, left, <clears throat> so that's the Yelp search page. So if you were to type in free text on a location, the results that you see are uh, powered by Elasticsearch. Uh, we also have more real-time searches like for transactions, things like reservations and uh, delivery. Uh, and a lot of the ad content on the search page is also powered by Elasticsearch. Um, we also have, um, Elasticsearch also powers recommendations at Yelp. So if you were to use the request report feature uh, and you were to submit a, um, a request for a plumbing job at your house, uh, we provide the ability to send competing quotes uh, to other businesses and those recommendations uh, are powered by Elasticsearch. And finally, if uh, you know, you're know you looking for uh, just the right chicken tikka masala, then uh, the <clears throat> you can go to the business page and search for reviews as well. So we support tech search as well. Uh, like I said, this is just like a preview. Like we have used Elasticsearch for a host of other use cases and internally, uh, like um, storing, like uh, visualizing some of our security logs and also internally for test results for some of our services. Um, so the agenda for today's talk is uh, so we're starting off by uh, talking about what the Elastic, uh, what our search backend looked like prior to Elasticsearch. Uh, Gunther will be talking about that. Uh, we'll then have um, we'll go over some of the challenges and limitations that and some of the bottlenecks that you're encountering, uh, which led us to the current Elasticsearch based search backend. Uh, Karthik uh, and Umesh, who are speakers, will be talking about the ranking and indexing side of things. Uh, we'll then cover a few lessons that we learned along the way, um, which hopefully are good takeaways for some of you. Uh, and then we'll spend some time uh, towards the end to go over a few advanced topics uh, and use cases and features that uh, were enabled because of our transition to Elasticsearch. So, uh, so with that, uh, yeah, Gunther. <laughs> Hi, um, before we start talking about the Elasticsearch backend that we have at Yelp, I want to talk a little bit about the backend that we used before we switched to Elasticsearch. And I guess one of the reasons is that a lot of characteristics of this backend are um, influenced on how we designed our Elasticsearch backend. So the basic idea of the, of the backend that we had before was that we used Lucene, we didn't use Elasticsearch, so we had our own custom application that directly used Lucene. We used the client-server architecture, or, or how we call it, we had like indexing nodes and query nodes. Where indexing nodes are responsible for like waiting your index files, 
and the query nodes are responsible for like serving those index files to the user. Um, the whole application got deployed on Yelp's Pasta platform. So Pasta is the platform that we use for microservice deployments. Um, essentially, like you deploy each service with a Docker container. And one of the characteristics of that platform is that it's stateless. So you can tell Pasta, for example, schedule three instances of that container on US West, give me five instances on US East, or something like this. And it starts up a new container from scratch. Um, if you restart a container, if you stop a container, all of the data within that container gets lost, and every new container starts up from the same state. So if you want to keep any data between restarts, uh, you usually need to use like an external data store. In our case, we use a Swave in the case of the scene, but also use other data stores. So the basic idea of the old architecture was that the indexing nodes essentially like what the indexing requests are from a Kafka queue. And in regular intervals, for example, once an hour, I'm deployed a snapshot and uploaded that snapshot to S3. And then the indexing nodes, so the first thing that an indexing node does when it starts up on Pasta is reading the snapshot from S3, I'm loading it and serving the, serving the index. So now we have like two questions on how we solve them. The first one is like, how, how, how do we distribute new snapshots? Like how do we load a new snapshot into the query node? Um, we use the easy solution for this because like we deploy to past and it's easy to stop and start services. Every time we want to just roll out a new rush of the index, we just flip all of the existing instances. So we bring up new instances that wait the new index from S3 and we kill the old instances that serve the older version of the index. And it's similar on the indexing nodes. So we don't want to restart the indexing nodes, but like every now and then those nodes are going to restart and they don't have persistent storage. So essentially what they do, um, if you restart an indexing node for whatever reason, they get the latest version of the snapshot uh, from S3, figure out what's the Kafka offset that we used for that snapshot, and then it just like rewind to Kafka, go back to that snap, go back to that offset, and have a little bit of duplicate work that they index, but we're not going to lose any data. Um, from the routing of the requests, it looked a little bit like this. So essentially, like, our data is too large to store on a single host, so we, we need to use sharding. We need to split the data to multiple hosts. And if you look at how Yelp works, um, all our data is usually, like, based on geographical areas. If you have a search request, you're interested in the best pizza in San Francisco or New York, but you usually don't have global searches. So what we essentially do is, like, we split the data or we split the world based on geographical boundaries, and we put, like, each geolocation or each range into, like, a specific shard. Um, to abstract it away a little bit so that like other consumers at Yelp don't need to deal with those sharding implementation details, we have like a coordinator service, and the main idea of the coordinator service is you send one request to the coordinator service, it figures out which shards are responsible. This could be like one shard, or it could be multiple shards if you like exactly on the boundary. And then it gets back all of the related results. And if you get results back from multiple shards, it merges them together to one uniform response and sends it back to the person who originally requested such. Um, main challenging with the system, like one of the major challenges was, challenges was a delayed indexing. So nowadays, we have a lot of features that depend on real-time indexing. We have like delivery, we have reservations and so on. So it doesn't work if you create a snapshot once an hour, that it's going to take too long. Um, another issue was the operational burden. So back when we designed the system, um, the, the amount of data and the amount of queries that we had was like much, much lower than, than the data that we have now. And once, once that amount grows too large, like you can usually like patch your system to grow with more data, but at some point you need to re-architect your system to like fulfill the new requirements that you have. And um, one other interesting point is that our original system, the way that it worked was that the queries were essentially like hard coded within the, within the search system. So we said like it's this type of query and then the search code itself generated a Lucene query, uh, which worked fine for the search team. But when you have other teams in the same company that want to use this, your search backend for like different use cases, they can't really use it without modifying your code base. So one really nice property about moving to Elasticsearch later on was that we have like a gener generic query DSL that we didn't have in the old system. Cool, and Umesh is now going to talk about the current Elasticsearch backend that we have and how it solved those challenges that I just explained. Thank you, Gunther. Um, in this section, I'll be detailing the modernization of our uh, search backend to an Elasticsearch-based one. But before we get there, I would like to make a quick uh, mention of uh, the, one of the key requirements of this uh, project was, this was essentially uh, infrastructure project in a way. So one of the key requirements was, if you search for, let's say, restaurants in SF, 
on the old system or the new system, we still need to see the exact same results in the same order, uh, potentially with the same scores. Which means, at a code level, what this translates to is all the code we've been writing for search since the time of inception of VL, which is 10 plus years, we need to somehow run this code more or less as is in the new system. Which, th which then brings us to this picture. Now, this was uh, roughly a representation of our uh, leaf search node. This is essentially our Java microservice, which is a uh, wrapper around the seed. Um, and let's see what it does. It will give us an idea of the things we need to port over to the new system. I'm going to use this pointer here in this work. All right, cool. So we get a search request. So let us uh, consider we get a request that says restaurants in San Francisco um, which are good for kids, for example. So this roughly translates to a query with a filter good for kids, which could be uh, one of the attributes on the index. Um, then a geo box for SF potentially, and restaurants is a free text in there. Um, so then after that, we need to run it through analysis, which is essentially tokenization of free text. Um, we have a bunch of code, uh, which is called analysis, uh, across languages and locales to tokenize text differently for different languages and locales. Um, and this again was our custom uh, code based off like using APIs, token streams, token filters and such, which we still needed to use in order to get the similar results. Eventually then uh, we run the ranking algorithms. So uh, we do not use a default ranking that Elasticsearch or Lucene back in the day provides, but we rather have our own uh, complex models running in here, which we'll talk about later. But essentially you can think of the scoring being a factor of two main uh, kind of feature categories. One is document based, which means uh, in our case, business is a document, which is its index by its ID. So a restaurant and SF is a business or a plumber or somewhere. So the document features uh, are something you can store in the last uh, in the Lucene index. And then there were other features like the query time features, let's say for time of the day or maybe user preferences, which are cannot be directly mapped to the document itself or the business. So they go on the Java heap. Um, one such critical feature we had here was um, CTR or click-through rate. So some of you who might have worked in the ads or search land probably know this. But to give a quick primer on what CTR is, uh, essentially it's a very important signal which allows the relevance engineers to understand how well uh, our search engine is working in that if I search for a restaurant in SF and the user typically clicks on the second result, your search is more or less working better than if the user has to click on the seventh result on the fourth page. Uh, so that kind of information, which uh, takes into account the clicks and impressions for particular queries is stored in the heap here. So this is how our system uh, more or less looked like. Now, this slide tries to formalize uh, the components into some logical uh, pieces here. So naturally, it flows from the previous slide. We have custom ranking analyzers, there's a ton of data on the Java heap, uh, which we need to do something about. And then there are other extensions, like advanced features uh, you can think of, and I think Karthik will cover these in detail in the future slides, but one of them could be highlights, um, or certain other details regarding which feature attributed to which score, which we refer to as score components, which helps us get the feedback so the relevance engineers can retrain their models. Right, so, like I've been uh, saying, we need to run the Java code, potentially some, uh, somewhere on Elasticsearch. And Elasticsearch uh, plays really nice, nicely here because it allows us to write native plugins um, to house our Java code. So here, we are trying to map the logical pieces that I mentioned before to some of the Elasticsearch constructs in blue. So the things in blue could be Elasticsearch interfaces or uh, abstract class names for the most part. Uh, and you know, I think this is still true for as of Elasticsearch version 6.3, in my opinion. Uh, the custom ranking, we are able to house it in an API called script plugin. The analyzers go inside uh, the analysis plugin. And the data on the Java heap um, typically lives in the doc values, but there is more to it, which I will cover uh, in the future slides. All right. So then looking uh, deeper into the custom ranking, um, I guess like, putting a code over is not as simple as, okay, let's move all this code over to the script plugin and uh, understand how Elasticsearch makes uh, calls into um, our code base at different levels. So one thing to understand here is when we get a query uh, on Elasticsearch, 
each JVM uh, basically is a shard, which has one to n segments potentially. And Elasticsearch is single threaded in that aspect where for every single segment, it'll go over it serially. And then each segment itself then goes over the documents also serially. So you can think of the score as shard, let's start at zero. So shard zero, segment zero, document zero through n. Then it'll do segment one, document zero through k or whatever. Um, so this is important to remember uh, for things like performance uh, because like I mentioned before, we send over a lot of query parameters which are also features for scoring as a JSON blob. We need to deserialize them. So deserializing them here would be obviously a non-starter because then that's gonna slow down your scoring a lot. Deserializing them here is also a no good because um, note that we do real-time indexing and Lucene segments are immutable. So what happens is it just keeps making new and newer segments as you index more and more documents. And that means your search has to go one segment after the other. So potentially like the place to deserialize or do some expensive operations would be at the per shard level. And again, the blue uh, text in blue here represents the most current uh, Elasticsearch method or uh, interfaces. But I guess the key takeaway here is these class names change with ES versions and they even break with minor version changes of ES. So please be, uh, and when I say break, they might not break syntactically, but they break semantically, which means you think your code is working, but it's just working really slowly, uh, which is more dangerous. So make sure that these scopes um, are respected even in the, and they work as you think they would do actually work. Analyzers. Um, this one um, was one of the critical pieces which kind of like almost held us back from thinking about this project initially. Uh, like I mentioned before, we could not have regression. So we didn't have much opportunity to, to think, or rethink analyzers from scratch and say, let's just, you know, uh, trash analyzers and use the default Elasticsearch ones or whatever. So what could we do? We had to somehow run the uh, old analyzers. The one big issue here was uh, our analyzers were based off a really old version of Lucene, 3.x, but the new analyzer, or the new uh, Lucene that Elasticsearch used uh, was 6.x. Now, how do you use like this interaction between the two different Lucene versions in the same JVM? So a quick fix and a hack, uh, what we did was use shading, a technique called shading. So Certain build tools like Maven, we use Maven, uh, you can relocate your namespaces. So what you can do is you can hide your org Apache Lucene and say, uh, let's refer it to as com, Yelp, search, old school, analyzers, whatever. So every time when you import com, Yelp, search, yada, yada, uh, analyzers, it's going to import the 3.x version. And when you say org Apache Lucene, it's going to get the 6.x version. So, and then you have this bridge in the Elasticsearch code in the analysis plugin somewhere here which goes from the old to the new, sorry, the new to the old, and back. Uh, again, this comes with a warning sign that we had to do this for a POC, and it has edge cases where this broke horribly. For example, uh, offsets in highlights. So without going too much into detail, what happens is that Lucene, as the versions get updated, they get more and more strict with the offset locations that they maintain. So for one example, if you have a synonym uh, token uh, filter, and let's say you produce multiple synonyms for the same word, if you tend to produce shorter uh, length names, then the offsets go backwards. And this is not allowed in the future Elasticsearch versions, like we cannot maintain the offsets that go backwards. Uh, so certain things like this break, uh, which is a risk. Uh, but if you want something as a POC quickly, this uh, worked well for, uh, well for us. But then the better time consuming fix eventually is just update your Lucene version <laughs> or rewrite your analyzers um, if the product permits that. All right, and finally, um, another important thing was getting data off the Java heap. Uh, like Gunther mentioned, like with time it was getting harder to maintain the JVM instances with like this humongous amount of uh, heap, and then we had run into GC issues and whatnot. So for the most part, our data was uh, nicely able to be mapped to um, doc values, and what doc values are in ESR um, is essentially a disk-based uh, uh, RAM, uh, disk-based access, but they rely on OS for the disk access. So as long as your heap is uh, not huge, but you have enough uh, free uh, memory, the OS is gonna take care of making sure uh, this is this cached. Um, and that's what, uh, we, we do have a lot of doc value lookups for every single uh, uh, score that we generate. Then there is the problem of what about the query parameters? Like what about time of day, user preferences? Like I mentioned before, we send that over uh, in the JSON and we deserialize it once per uh, shard. And then there is even more, um, 
advanced features, like I mentioned before, CTR. Um, so for a business, so how does the data structure look like for us? Uh, for a business, let's say, how many times was it clicked on when the query was restaurants? We have to store this information versus how many times was it clicked on when the query was Mexican food? Uh, this is important to know because it's a good feature or signal to rank our business. So Elasticsearch did have the ability to have blobs, but it did not have the ability to do a lookup on them and then get back them as a byte buffer. So essentially this is your own uh, custom data structure which you can do whatever with you when you want. So we had to uh, uh, submit a patch upstream to Elasticsearch which they uh, were happy to merge. And so if you can do something like this in your code now, put a blob in there with the structure you know, get it back out uh, using a, just this basic API. Right, and now Karthik's gonna talk more about the indexing side of things. Uh, thanks, Omesh. Uh, that was a good uh, walkthrough of how we have looked into the uh, old code base and how we have ported it into Elasticsearch. But I'm gonna share more about like how we got data into Elasticsearch from the old Lucene-based system. So as Gunther mentioned, uh, this was the old indexing pipeline. Uh, there is one caveat here around like refresh. And when I say refresh, it's uh, when the data is generated here to when it appears here, like when the data is indexed versus when it is queried. Elasticsearch, uh, or in general search engines call this as refresh interval. So the refresh interval we had was in the order of hours. Um, and because we are using Elasticsearch, we were already able to tune it uh, to order of minutes or seconds if we need. So some of the requirements that we wanted to solve on the indexing side when we moved to the new system was not having a delay of hours for like critical information such as reservations or delivery to a near real time index. We get this for free just because we use Elasticsearch, which is amazing. The second requirement is uh, in the legacy system, we had only a single source of data, uh, but Yelp and uh, other teams were moving into a world where they would generate data from multiple sources. You can imagine there are like bad jobs which run every now and then who wants to feed data into Elasticsearch, but just for a section of the document, not the whole document. As we have developed more things on Elasticsearch uh, and during our initial prototyping, we have realized the need for frequent backfills um, I'll go about them a little more in the upcoming slides. But one big challenge with optimal indexing is we want to safeguard the cluster to not overload it and trash it just with our indexing load because the same cluster is also serving critical search requests. So when I say backfills, it necessarily means assuming the cluster just came up fresh with no data, how do we fill it with all the millions of businesses that we had before? So that's what we call backfills. Uh, one primary reason we started to think about backfills was worst case failure recovery. Let's say for some reason all of your cluster goes down, how do you bring it back up in an efficient way? Keep in mind that uh, Elasticsearch also offers snapshot restore, but that was uh, after we have built the whole system, like uh, we took a while to enable snapshot restore. Uh, this was after prototyping and going to production. The second caveat is uh, we always yearn to be on the latest version of Elasticsearch. And because we have a bunch of custom code, especially like around analyzers, whenever we upgrade our cluster, there is also going to be changes on the analyzers um, because ES has API changes. In this case, we don't want to just use what Elasticsearch offers, which is like a rollover of old version to new version, but instead want to feed all of the data back to the cluster. Um, this is to make sure like the data that you're indexing versus the data that you're searching match well together. Also, uh, as folks know, Elasticsearch has two configurations per index. One is replicas and the other is shards. Um, replicas is something that you can change dynamically. Um, you can up and down the number of copies of the index, but not really the sharding. Sharding is how you div divide the data into multiple pieces uh, to scale across. So whenever we want to change sharding configuration, you run into the same problem, which is you have to feed the data back altogether. Whenever we have changes in text analysis, uh, maybe like a naive example is, let's say you have a list of stop words that you want to get rid of, um, and for some reason someone put pizza in there, um, and you're removing it from your index, which is super bad. In order to get back pizza into Lucene, you have to feed the data all over again. So that's another backfill scenario. 
We have been uh, also facing a number of issues around like uh, when we start off, we have a mapping with uh, some of the basic fields. But as we develop, we realize, oh, I want to have an exact match on this field. Uh, one example is, say, name of the business, where you want an exact match on the business. So the way ES offers is it offers subfields, where you can just say, oh, apart from the analyzers that I have, I just want to use it as a keyword and um, do exact matches on it. But for this, again, you have to feed all the data. Also, ES offers a feature to turn on and off indexing. But uh, if you weren't indexing a field before and want to index it again, you have to backfill in order for the filters to work. So these are all the backfill scenarios, which is one of the primary challenge. Uh, there is one other challenge, which I mentioned before, which is can I have multiple sources of data to the same Elasticsearch cluster? One thing to keep in mind is uh, the immediate thought that comes is, oh, can I use the update API that Elasticsearch offers? There are some performance problems because of this, uh, especially because of the way that update API works. Internally, because Elasticsearch uses Lucene, Lucene segments are immutable. So even if you use update API to update, a, say, a field in the document, it's not a partial update per se, but uh, yes has to read the document, update the relevant section in the JSON, and put it back. And then the new Lucene segment is written, and then ES takes care of like uh, refreshing the document and merging the segments back together. So from a performance point of view, when you have multiple sources, which ha might have bursty indexing requests, this is pretty bad for the cluster. Uh, so not, not only do you have reduced throughput of indexing during bursty indexing requests, but it will also hurt the Elasticsearch cluster performance, which is serving real-time traffic. So read before write wasn't really like a good option for us. Another caveat is in order to use update API, you need like underscore source always enabled, uh, which is not something which is applicable for all clients in general. So our solution was to use a data store, which supports write-heavy uh, requirements. Um, and at the time, Yelp already had great support uh, and was Cassandra was generally available with uh, like many other applications already using it. Uh, so we make use of the partial update and how it's different on Cassandra to solve this problem. The way we do this is uh, we basically use Cassandra as our source of truth and whenever there is a change in a section of the document, we build a complete document from Cassandra and then use bulk indexing for yes. Um, Bulk indexing is like really performant in terms of throughput because you can chunk all of your data into one request and send it to ES. So just a primer on how Cassandra partial updates are different. Um, because we use Cassandra, we have offloaded most of the indexing load out of Elasticsearch. So the cluster is safe from uh, heavy indexing and bursty indexing in general. And you can also have like many sources. Cassandra has like efficient upsearch uh, because it treats everything as a new value and does the uh, resolution during read time. Um, it also has like uh, good compaction. And uh, one caveat is uh, because we want to do full backfills within order of hours, uh, Cassandra, we started looking into like cool uh, Cassandra features for efficient full scans. So we use like uh, an optimal partition key and use like range queries on Cassandra so that we can read sequentially on the disk from Cassandra, send it to ES. But what does the new pipeline look like? Um, we put the data in Cassandra, but how do we tell when it has to go to Elasticsearch? So the way we did this is we used Kafka as our chain stream. Whenever we put our primary key into Cassandra, we put the primary key into uh, Kafka, so the indexer knows there has been an update on that doc ID. When I say primary key, it's the doc ID that we use on Elasticsearch, which is, uh, you can think, like business ID. So indexer keeps pulling from Kafka. Whenever there is a document ID that it sees, goes back to Cassandra, gets the whole document keeps building the bulk request. When the bulk uh, request fills up, sends it to Elasticsearch. But what does this mean? Uh, we got backfills from order of days in the past to order of four, hour, four hours. So when we were initially prototyping, we did a bunch of backfills. And like doing backfills in order of hours has been uh, quite useful, especially we have been, because we have been changing code and uh, other things all the time. One another thing to keep in mind is always be careful about indexing things to Elasticsearch. Uh, we have a bunch of configurations and uh, knobs here which control the volume of indexing to Elasticsearch. Um, we rate throttle the indexer, control how many documents are in the bulk request, how many parallel requests, and such.
Cool. Uh, I just wanted to throw some light on uh, the future that we are we are headed into for uh, indexing. Um, at Yelp, we are uh, moving into a framework where we are relying on Kafka as the data sharing mechanism with sources and syncs. This works well uh, because even if we had used Kafka with, say, a Cassandra sync, getting that side effect of putting the key in Kafka kind of seems uh, not really plausible with the uh, Cassandra sync connector that we are building right now. So we're moving towards a Flink-based system where it still support multiple sources, but all of the state is maintained inside Flink. And we still have all the control knobs that we uh, have it in Flink. Um, this is our ongoing uh, development. So just wanted to share. Cool. Uh, so now we have read, like, we have uh, looked through most of how we have moved from a legacy system to a new system totally powered by Elasticsearch. Um, we have learned quite a bit about Elasticsearch in general, and we just wanted to share these lessons for folks. Uh, cool. So as we developed uh, and moved queries onto Elasticsearch, um, we ran into a bunch of issues where like the queries weren't performant. We didn't have like a lot of insight into what Elasticsearch was doing, as opposed to what Lucene was doing in the past. Elasticsearch offers a cool profile API, which gets you gives you information about everything in the query. You know how much time you're spending on the query. You get to get stats from even subsets of the query. Like you can imagine Elasticsearch query to be like nested queries. It gives you uh, stats all the way to the lowest level of uh, Elasticsearch or Lucene. So you know where your bottlenecks are. It also gives you stats on like aggregations, how much time you're spending on aggregations and such. We have used like a bunch of Java debugging tools as we uh, went ahead. Um, always use like uh, out of the box Java tools like JProfiler, JMap, JStack. We kept taking like uh, thread dumps and looking at like our memory usage uh, and tried to improvise because we were using like custom Java code on top of Elasticsearch. We had to like be super careful at what scope we are doing things and uh, improve as we go. In terms of garbage collection. Um, we have been using G1 GC for more than a year now. Uh, the GC behavior has been idle, and uh, we we aren't going back to CMS. Cool. The other lesson in terms of performance is uh, we have tried to scale uh, Elasticsearch as much as we could. So we have tried a bunch of shard configurations with our data. Uh, because this was before we went live launching, we had some bandwidth to like test out different sharding configurations and get the optimal soft spot. But keep in mind that uh, you can't keep having more and more shards, because at some point, the performance starts to dip. Um, so you have to find like the soft spot, which works well. But it's completely application specific and data specific. So keep experimenting with uh, lots of sharding configurations. Um, and that performs really well. Also, we use Elasticsearch Cerebro, which gives you like a complete layout of how your shards are allocated to all your data nodes. Uh, always make sure that uh, you have the shards distributed uniformly across your data nodes, and make sure if you have like multiple indices, that the load is also distributed optimally across the data nodes. If there's like skewness and one of the data nodes is getting all the search requests, that turns into a hot node and uh, trash like your performance. I think Umesh already mentioned about doc values before. Um, doc values are like disk based as opposed to heap based. But uh, just because they're on the disk doesn't mean they don't perform well. Um, make sure you have enough memory for the disk cache so that your doc values are like as performant as they were on the heap. Another learning as we launched and uh, got a bunch of pages is always safeguard your cluster. It's not always good for on-call to wake up in the middle of the night just to figure out what's going on with the cluster. Two key things that we found super useful, uh, especially when you don't have a lot of control on like multiple clients hitting your cluster. One is global search timeouts. This is uh, telling the JVM that when there is a search, and if it, if it exceeds more than this timeout, it'll just stop proceeding with uh, scoring any more documents. So just set the global search timeouts, and it's applied to all the clients. There cannot be a client which will send like a match all request and you know, just break the cluster. This uh, second one is terminate after. The first one allows you to set a timer. The second one allows you to set like a counter. 
Like per shard, you can't score more than n documents. So let's say you have uh, like a million documents in the shard. You don't want one scoring to shard, like score more than say 10,000. It returns a partial result, uh, which is okay, but like good to check with product on uh, whether they're okay with partial results. Um, but that is also good to safeguard your cluster. Another cool feature that Elasticsearch built, uh, which is available after version 6.1, is adaptive replica selection. So as you have, say, four replicas, uh, you want to not hit the data node, which is already slow. Like ES has re replica stats, which knows like, oh, one of the nodes is going bad and is turning hot. So it'll stop querying that replica, but instead query something else. By default, uh, it is turned off in version 6.x, but they have made it default in version 7, which is cool. They should have done it in 6, but. Um, they have stats and other things that you can look at. I'm also gonna go through a query and fetch phase in the advanced topics, but uh, if you need more things about your document as a part of your Elasticsearch request, know that there are two phases, which is query and fetch. Uh, do things only optimally in the fetch phase if you know when to do things. It is really important for performance. Uh, we'll talk about it a bit more later. Always use a slow query logger. It gives you the most uh, slowest elastic search queries. You can set like threshold of what you define as a slow query, fix those slow queries, um, or else your cluster is gonna break sometime. Cluster upgrades are quite breaking, um, as we have realized. Um, we definitely go through like all the release notes thoroughly, test thoroughly before going to production, um, like have all the infra to do that testing and uh, evaluations, evaluations before doing the upgrades. Another quick note on aggregations. Um, aggregations is like analytical information you can do on Elasticsearch after your search request. Um, we have realized that fields which have high cardinality, which is like high distinct values, are really bad if they are used within aggregations. This is because of some of the bucketing logic that Elasticsearch has to do, go with. The second thing is uh, if you're doing aggregations on keywords, which is like strings or text, well, keywords and text are different because text is analyzed, keywords are not. The performance of Elasticsearch for keyword aggregation is going to be pretty slow. Uh, it allows for something called eager loading global ordinals. Uh, always turn on eager global ordinals for keywords if you're doing aggregations. Or else Elasticsearch tries to build global ordinals at uh, search time, which is going to be bad for the query performance. Elasticsearch provides a benchmarking tool called Rally. We have adapted to it and uh, tried to benchmark any change that we want to do on top of it. Make sure you use that tool. Uh, know the environment that you are going to productionize it with. Know your change, test only for your change, but do it before you go to production. And I can't stress enough about like monitoring. Uh, ES already gives a bunch of stats about your index, like how, what is the search rate, what is the index rate, how many documents are deleted, refreshed, merged. Keep an eye on your monitoring um, and make sure your cluster is like good enough from breaking apart. With this, I'm gonna hand off to Omesh, uh, who's gonna share about like how our life is after we are moved to Elasticsearch. Thank you. Right, so let's go right in. So, what are the benefits of uh, all this work we did for uh, tens of quarters? I don't know how many quarters, but. One is obviously we could delete the thousands of lines of code to manage federation, coordination, and we just got all this for free from Elasticsearch for the most part with a lot of knobs to turn. Uh, the defaults is work for most part. If they don't, you can ha you always have those knobs, which results uh, in option, uh, bullet number two is happier on call, which means happier engineers. They can actually work on features and uh, writing uh, new cool features for Yelp, which makes more Yelp more money, I guess. Uh, <laughs> equally importantly, uh, can now this code base be used by other teams? Um, because the functionality is the same. And every, every, most teams that, uh, like Krishna mentioned before, want to do filter and ranking. This now opens the doors uh, for other teams like ads and request a code to kind of use the similar code base uh, or the same strategies on different, completely different ES clusters. Uh, and last but not the least, um, now does this unlock new functionalities, which is a good segue into our next topic, uh, which is the slightly more advanced topics. And I'm gonna cover the first one. It's called learning to rank. So with this said, the next question was, okay, right, we kind of do some machine learning um, already, uh, but can we take this to the next level and 
how does Elasticsearch specifically help us here? How does this make some of our uh, work or life easier because of just porting over to a more general framework here? Um, and so we would we decided, okay, let's look at around like what people have to offer on Elasticsearch in the open source world, as long as it fits uh, these three criterion. Obviously, we need to use uh, the Elasticsearch infrastructure. We need to be computing uh, the expensive scoring part on the shard itself, as opposed to getting data outside of the uh, Elasticsearch nodes, because that means now you're uh, bottlenecked on the network. No matter how many more nodes you add, that's not going to really help you. Uh, and finally, again, uh, for Yelp, reusing this infrastructure across teams was also important. So in our quest uh, to look out at uh, plugins, we stumbled upon Learning to Rank plugin. It's initially developed by Open Source Connections, and at the time, uh, it was used by a few companies like Snagajob, Wikimedia, uh, and a few others. So we started looking into it as plugin. It solved most of our use cases, uh, and we had to collaborate to this plugin and uh, uh, become collaborators essentially to support some of the niche use cases which it did not um, support for us. Now, what are the benefits of using this one? Uh, obviously, it uses uh, Elasticsearch to host machine learned models, so you don't need a separate model server to host your machine learned models. Um, the next point is a lot of our relevance engineers don't actually even work on Elasticsearch. They might work on a different database like Redshift or MySQL or whatever to get, actually get data, train, uh, train on the data there in an offline world and then submit us. Now we have this nice um, decoupled interface where they can submit us some feature and model language, and we can then map it to something the learning to rank slash LTR um, can then post it to Elasticsearch. Uh, also, we need to be able to support multiple kinds of models, linear models, XGBoost, RankLib. So it fit the bill really well. And then this picture uh, essentially defines how we use learning to rank today at Yelp for most of our critical workflows. So again, I'm going to try to use a pointer here. Uh, and this is a story of two parts. One is where you upload the models and features via REST, and the other is when you actually query it. So let's go through part one. When you upload uh, your models and features, we use learning to rank essentially as a delegator. It's just handing off stuff to the other backend um, uh, scorers or rankers, essentially. Uh, and what's a, So let's say we have a model with five features here. A feature five scorer could simply be an ES query. Filter, which is a basically could be a filter on good for kids. Uh, fe feature four could be something more complex, like a derived expression or a mathematical equation on top of some basic features. Then we could also use painless scripts, or you could still use your own native plugins uh, contributing to one or more features. Um, what happens now when the query comes in is you, our uh, backend ma microservice simply ident identifies the type of the model this should invoke. So let's say the model name in this case is restaurants. So it'll say, okay, I need uh, to invoke the model name restaurants, and these are all the query uh, feature selections like time of day, user personalization, et cetera, et cetera, which are the parameters. So we simply send the model name and the uh, feature, uh, sorry, the query parameters over. And then learning to rank then already knows by the keyword, hey, this is a restaurants, a restaurants model. So let me go ask all these features for their scores. And it does, uh, these, these, in the, these guys in the back end do all the work needed. And then the eventual computation um, is done in learning to rank depending on your model. If it's a linear model, then it's a mathematical equation, uh, linear equation. If it's a XG boson, it's a more tree form, tree based. And that's when it gives you the answer back. All right. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, Yelp is now collaborating uh, to the LTR plugin. Uh, I have a talk which kind of goes through uh, more of the details of what we have to change, particularly in the LTR, to make it uh, used for Yelp. Uh, I give this talk uh, at Haystack, uh, which is a conference held by Open Source Connections uh, uh, in Virginia. So please, you can feel free to take a look at that. Uh, like I mentioned, as of today, we use several of our uh, search workflows uh, using LTR. Uh, and since we are vested in the plugin, contributions are welcome. Uh, we will happily review your uh, code changes. All right, with that, I'm going to hand off to Gunther for the next advanced topic. OK, I'm going to talk a little bit about map type, um, which is one of the custom data types that we implemented for Elasticsearch. So basically, like Elasticsearch provides like predefined data types that we can use. But we have a few use cases um, where those data types didn't really work too well for us. So we wrote our own custom data types. And the problem that map type solves is like, Let's imagine you have like a map field in each document, and you want to look up like a single item, a single key within this map as fast as possible. 
And I have an example here. So let's assume that's the search da database that we use. We have like different documents that are essentially like businesses that have a number of fields. And we have one field that we call delivery times. And let's say that our use case is like, if someone orders delivery from a business, we want to know, we want to take the time that the business takes to deliver to the geo box of the user or to the general error of the user. We want to take that average time for the delivery into account and put it into our scoring model. So the map that we would store in the business for this would essentially be like a mapping where we go from like a geo hash to the average delivery time of the geo hash. And of course, because businesses are in different locations, like we have a large different number of geo hashes, so we can't just use like an elastic search field or something like this for the geo hashes, because this would increase the state by too much. There are like a number of existing encoding formats that we could have used. So usually like for our data pipelines and so on, we use, mostly use Arrow for encoding. But one issue with Arrow is that you need to decode all of your data to access like a single item, which doesn't work for us. However, there are two other formats um, that actually work really well for this problem, which is like Captain Proto and Flat Buffers. Like Captain, and Flat Buffers is by Google, Captain Proto is like an open source project. And both of them allow you, if you like, have like serialized data to access one or multiple elements in that serialized data without decoding all of the data. Um, one issue for us with both, of those, uh, with both of those releases was that essentially what we want to do, we want to define our schema when we create a new index. And both Captain Proto and Flat Buffers are a little bit more static in that you have like a schema, then you want a compiler over it, which gives you like generated code and so on, which is not as dynamic as we need it to be so that we can run it every time someone creates a new index. Um, I have an example of how map type looks like. So on the left side, left upper side, we see an example of a schema. So we have like an example field. We say type is map type. We set doc values to true because we store the data within the doc value. And for the key, we have like actually a composite key here where we select the keys like a geo hash and the vint. And you can imagine it's like a tuple. It's just two both elements that build the key. And then also for the values, an example, we don't have a single value, but we actually have like multiple items in the value map where we have like the average delivery time and maybe like an average rating for that particular geo box and, and, and the time of day or something like this. On the right hand side, we see an indexing request. I think one thing to mention is on the indexing request, if you look at the key of the map that we post, which is the string with the pipe symbol that separates those different elements. And the main reason for this is like indexing requests are JSON data. So in JSON, the key of a map uh, needs to be a string. So we can't like directly post a tuple or something like this. But on the value side, the value itself is like a map. So the value is just directly the map that we post to this. And then on, on the bottom, you see like an example, for example, in painless, um, if you want to access the data. Um, you just get the field, then you can get a different geo hash, and you can get one of those sub values. So map type implements the different Java interfaces like abstract map and so on. So if you use it in any of your native code, you can just assume it's a Java map and treat it like this. Um, how does map type work? Um, so essentially the way how it works is pretty simple. So on the storage side, we use two different lists. Um, we have one list that we use for the, for the keys, and we have one list that we use for the values. Um, we support like custom data types that I showed before. So first we serialize the data and then store it in the key list and in the value list. And the key list itself is sorted by the serialized data of the key. And the value list has the same order as the key list. So the first element in the value list would correspond to the first element in the key list. Second element in the value list would correspond to the second element in the key list which makes the lookups really simple. So for the lookup, you can first do, you first take the data that you want to look up, the key that you want to look up, encode it, um, do a binary search on the value list, uh, get the index of that field, go back to the key list, look up the index, and you have the data that you want to access that you can directly decode. Um, in practice, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, I have an example here of an edge case, which is like we support different types. One of those types is like a string type. So the whole case is like really easy if you have like fixed types fields because a fixed length for your individual items because then you know you have like, for example, seven elements, you have four bits per element. So you can just like directly calculate those offset values. Um, if you have elements that have a different length, it's a little bit more complicated because then you need like an additional level of interaction that actually that keeps those pointers to the start and the end values of your data. Um, what's the current state of map type? So we're currently using it for in production at Yelp. And one of the use cases like the CTR data um, that Umesh mentioned earlier. 
And we actually just published a blog post uh, yesterday about MapType that goes a little bit into more detail about how MapType works. So it's in the Yelp Engineering blog, um, if you're interested. And we, we are currently planning also to have an open source release of MapType, which might happen like in the next month or so. Cool, and now I'm going to hand over to Umesh to talk about, uh, to Kartik to talk about aggregations in Elasticsearch. Cool. Uh, we have seen uh, how to do like custom ranking and custom analysis. Uh, the next three topics are going to talk about like other custom things that we can do on top of Elasticsearch. So as I mentioned before, aggregations are like summaries of data after your search query. Um, one example is, let's say you search for restaurants in San Francisco, you get a total of 12,000 odd hits, which is 12,000 odd restaurants. And you know for some field, uh, you can bucket by the values, like value one, there are 7,000 restaurants, value two, there are 6,000 restaurants. This is the default aggregation that Elasticsearch offers out of the box with uh, something they call terms aggregation on particular fields. But uh, let's say we have a scenario where we want custom aggregations for these fields. Like uh, let's say you wanted to group this buckets by your custom logic, which relies on multiple values of the field. Uh, for example, let's say you want to uh, count by whether the restaurants are good for kids, and that relies on multiple values in the field. Let's say you want to know if it's good for nightlife, and that might rely on uh, 20 different values, whether they exist in the document. So I'm gonna share how we solve this problem. Uh, we want to get stats bucketed by derived values rather than the raw values that exist in the field. The way we did this is uh, we implemented a search script um, and added it to the script plugin. So Elasticsearch offers a script plugin which allows you to write custom Java code and that is invoked whenever you use it in tandem with terms aggregation or anything uh, that expects the value. A good thing to note about search script is whenever you have per document use cases, you get access to the entire document in the search script. All you have to do is overwrite the run method to return what the terms aggregation expects. I'll just code to show you like a code snippet of how this works. We're extending the search script here, overwriting the run method. The key takeaway here is you have access to the get doc, which is the complete document. Then you do a get for your field and get back doc values. You can use these actual raw values and like derive whatever f values that you would like based on these values. And then return just the set of string that you think are your derived values. And then Elasticsearch takes care of your aggregation on top of these derived values that you have computed. How the query looks is also uh, a way to see how we are telling Elasticsearch to call your script. So let's call our stats custom stats. Within terms query, you're saying use my aggregator rather than the default aggregator that Elasticsearch already uses. So the, this triggers the code that I've shown before. Cool, uh, I think this has been mentioned in the past uh, uh, that we have something called score components, which is uh, a term for individual feature scores. So let's say you have a linear model and you want to know individual scores for every feature in that model. These feature scores are super useful for model training because that sets up like the feedback loop of what's going on in real time versus how you can train these models and update coefficients and other things. This is also useful for debugging uh, relevance changes, like, oh, you know one feature has been going off because of some change in the code, and you can go fix it. I think I mentioned this in the past, around, like there are two phases, query phase and fetch phase, so I'm just gonna dig a little deeper into that. This box is what we call the coordinating node. It gets the search request. It sends your request to multiple shards, so there are like multiple copies of this box where it actually fetches the documents based on your filter. So this is like, give me all the restaurants in San Francisco that are available in this shard. Then you run your custom scorer, get the score, return, each shard returns the document to score map to the coordinator. The coordinator does like the scatter gather. It fetches all the document and its scores, resorts it, fetches the top K. Now for the top K, it doesn't have anything else except the document except the score. So that's when it sends fetch me things about the document, um, and that's what we call the fetch phase. That's when it sends the shards, the IDs that it has to fetch, and that's where you uh, fetch the document and its relevant content. 
and return it in the final response. So whatever you put in the fetch phase is happening only for the top k documents that are that you're returning in the results. Keep in mind that even pagination works fine in this case. Like if you want to return 100 to a 120, you're only fetching those 20 documents. The way to do this is the search plugin again allows you to fetch, uh, add more fetch phases. Uh, Elasticsearch already has a bunch of fetch phases like highlights. Uh, there are like a few more. Uh, but you can add more fetch phases as you like. The flow is the same thing. You implement a search script, override the run method, but this time you return a map rather than a string, and the map can be your feature name to value. But the way to invoke this is through the script fields. Script fields is uh, what you get out of the document uh, by invoking your search script. But the overhead is that you're not scoring all the documents, uh, to, f to get the feature scores. Like, keep in mind that because we are using a custom ranker, we have to rerun the scorer to fetch just the score components and return them in the response. But because we are running it in the fetch phase, it's not uh, bad for performance. You're only doing it for the top K documents. This is how the query is gonna look. Uh, for script fields, which you call score components, uh, you're invoking the score component script that you have defined yourself. Cool. Uh, Moving on to the last advanced topic, which is uh, similarity. For uh, folks who aren't familiar with similarity, uh, in a way, you can think about it as, if you didn't have a custom ranker on top of Elasticsearch, the underscore score is what Elasticsearch or Lucene thinks is the score for the document. Like, if you just say, kid-friendly pizza place in San Francisco, you, you are letting Elas Lucene decide how well the document matches this query. Like you know that kid-friendly is a pretty rare term, so you want to boost documents which have a mention of kid-friendly in the reviews. And relatively, pizza is uh, less important or less weighted than kid-friendly because of the frequency in which it occurs for like restaurants in San Francisco. And place, again, depends on how it occurs uh, across the documents. So Lucene um, or Elasticsearch in general have default um, Similarity scorers, which is either TF-IDF um, or BM25. But let's say we want to do more things than just the default ones that come out of the box. Let's say we want to have a custom score uh, than the one that Lucene returns. Keep in mind that this underscore score is uh, below the custom score that we uh, return. Like we can fetch Lucene's underscore score and use this inside our custom score as well. So we want to have some more access to compute this underscore score than the default thing that uh, ES offers. So the way to do this is uh, in Elasticsearch, you can extend and override and use your own similarity, which is uh, the Lucene's interface. And it has access to two important things, which is term statistics and collection statistics. These gives you uh, numbers on your collection, like how many documents are there in the index, how many documents have a token kit friendly in the index, and also for the term itself, like how many times does kit friendly occur in a document, how many times does, a, does kit friendly occur in general across the index. So there are like a bunch of stats which Lucene provides. The good thing here is uh, these stats are already computed um, in the usual TF idea for BM25. So overriding and implementing a custom similarity doesn't have any extra overhead. You just have access to a lot of raw statistics which you can use. And again, tying uh, the similarity to your use case is you have to de declare it at the index setting level. You can declare it for either all the fields or one field specifically. Here we are saying default, so this similarity is used for text search on any field that uh, is in your index. Cool. Uh, so we have shared uh, the evolution of how Yelp had a Lucene-based system to how we went to Elasticsearch and how we are moving towards uh, Flink-based indexing and learning to rank uh, based searching. Uh, I'm gonna hand off to KRP to c conclude the talk. Thanks, Karthik. So yeah, um, like Karthik mentioned, like yeah, we are hiring. Uh, so please check out our careers page if you're interested. Um, and if you want to learn more about Yelp, <coughs> here are some resources. Uh, questions?
So my question is, uh, how do you scale up and scale down the clustering? Did you manually do it, or you have any like automation so you detect it or scale the clustering size of index search, or any other way that you suggest? Uh, yeah, uh, so we use Terraform to, and we use AWS uh, for Elasticsearch. So we have Terraform through which we can specify how many nodes we want to use for the cluster. We have a bunch of uh, hooks into AWS lifecycle, so we know what to do when we want to scale up and what to do when we want to scale down. Uh, Scale-ups are easier, like data nodes just come up and uh, ES takes care of the relocation of the shards. Scale-down is kind of tricky because you have to do and be very careful that you're not losing data in the process. So the, the, the combination of uh, lifecycle hooks and other cluster tooling that we have on top of it is what we use. Yeah, and just to add to that, like I think at this point we primarily do uh, auto-healing. We don't have uh, uh, infrastructure in place to scale dynamically, we, yeah, but that's something that we look at in the future. So do you scale up or a new cluster or you just scale up the original cluster? We, it, I mean, it depends on the problem that we are trying to solve, but we have both. Uh, we could scale up in place as well. It's just adding more data nodes. Uh, AWS brings up the new machines, and the data is, you know, reshuffled. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, you did mention that uh, you are planning to use Flink, right, for uh, for the new indexing pipeline. How do you? How are you going to ensure that it's not the writes are not going to impact the reads? Is there any specific things that you might uh, consider in implementing that new architecture? Uh, yeah. So when we use Flink, uh, we try to have some guardrails around it. Like one thing is uh, we have a rate throttler within Flink as well, which controls how many indexing requests are going out of Flink to Elasticsearch. Um, the second thing is uh, we want also want to reduce the number of duplicate requests that go to Elasticsearch. So let's say there are like 10 different resources updating the same document. We don't want to always constantly index the same document again and again. So we kind of try to like reduce the number of indexing requests. Does that answer? Yeah. And I guess the same uh, the the same constructs that we used for Cassandra still apply because we're still using Flink as their intermediate store, so uh, we don't have partial updates into Elasticsearch. Yeah. And uh, Flink's out of the box uh, Elasticsearch sync also comes up with a bunch of configs that we can tune. Like uh, I think it's mostly called the bulk processor configs, which defines number of documents and other things. So there are like lots of knobs we could turn to control indexing. Um, for the learning to rank part of the problem, uh, like vector embeddings for words are, you know, what we found quite useful in natural language types of tasks. And I'm wondering if you've been able to apply anything like that as like features in learning to rank. Yeah, that's a great question because uh, we have tried to do this um, in a few ways. Uh, nothing used in production right now for vector embeddings, but there's always this ask of like from the relevance engineers, hey, vector embeddings. So if you look at uh, the later versions of Elasticsearch, um, I think Maria Shapova, she works for Elastic. She has a, a PR which I think is merged, uh, which supports sparse and um, dense vectors and like can do cosine similarities already. Uh, so it's a different field type. I don't know what it's called exactly. Probably it's called sparse vector. Outside of that, there is another plugin. I forget the name of that. We did, uh, during one of the hackathons, we did a quick POC of uh, solving an image recognition problem using vector embeddings, where we reduced the um, uh, image to like a bunch of vectors. And it kind of used min hashing and LSH. Um, that was the technique used there. And it seemed to work okay, but nothing at production level yet. 
to give a brief answer. Any other questions? Great, then. Thank you very much for a fabulous talk. This is probably one of the best ones we've had at Elasticsearch and a fabulous venue. Uh, we are looking for speakers. Yelp is looking to hire people. So please <laughs> come and see me if you want to speak at this meetup. Come and see Yelp if you want to work in Elasticsearch on a great product. Thank you so much for tonight. Thank you. Bye for now. <laughs>